Okay, so um, my name is Patrick Hegberg. I look after the UK sales effort um, for Olio. Um, what I thought we'd do is share some exciting uh, new technology with you guys uh, this morning. So what's been really great is Leitham set me up quite nicely in terms of some of the challenges that you guys face in the public sector. I personally have been involved in selling applicant tracking systems into that space for the last 20 years and I absolutely concur in that I don't think the challenges have necessarily changed. I think we, we're more aware of them. Um, but I think technology is now moving us forward to be able to address some of those challenges. So what I was going to do today, just very briefly, is share with you um, some brand new talent insights that we are releasing. Um, this is the first time they've been aired publicly. Um, and I'm just going to kind of walk you through um, how you can now use technology to help understand what you probably already know but don't necessarily have the visual capability to um, establish how you might be able to go and change it or question the process like Lee was mentioning earlier. So what we've created is, is Talent Insights and Talent Insights um, in this case is a CPO dashboard. So this is the opportunity for whether it's a Chief People Officer or somebody at a strategic or operational level just to get a really good sense of where are the challenges, where are the bottlenecks, where are the issues that I perhaps need to understand and then drill into that to be able to start questioning what it is that we can do to try and alleviate some of the challenges that we might face. So what we've ultimately got here is a dashboard, it's a traffic light dashboard so it automatically shows me um, some of the areas where perhaps I might need to concentrate my attention just from a colour basis, so a traffic light system. Um, and I'm going to take you through just two or three of these this morning. I know we've run over slightly in that first session, so I'll probably need to uh, just canter through it a little bit quicker than originally planned. But the challenge that we've got is we capture all this data. You've got loads of data. Um, what you can't necessarily do easily is visualise it. You don't know how to put it in a format that allows you to get to it and, and understand um, the meaning of it. So what we've done, and, and it's with work from Siva. Siva, you might want to stand up and just introduce yourself. Siva's been working on um, the Talent Insights piece for, what would you say, in terms of time? When did you start this project? Six months ago. So about six months ago. And it's ever-evolving. Um, and what he's been challenged with is how can we make it easier? How can we make it easier for you guys to understand, okay, if we look at speed and we look at the things that we do as part of our process, how can we look at some of the challenges that we're faced with and hone in on that? So, very simply, at the top I can see here the number of vacancies, how many submitted applications, how many hires, this sort of stuff you get out of your normal statistics engine. What's my time to fill versus my time to hire? So there's, at what point did the person say they were going to leave versus when we actually managed to hire them in? So there's a slight nuance there. We can then filter on this data, so now we can start looking back in time and benchmarking against, well, this is where we are now, but how were we 12 months ago, two years ago, whatever it might be, and actually see the trend of change and where we might be going. I can actually drill down by even department or job grade. So what we're able to see is, is there some trends that are happening in certain parts of our organisation, perhaps that are doing it really well, versus some of the other areas of our organisation that perhaps aren't, and what is the difference? Where's the, where's, the, where's the change in the process that might address some of those challenges? I can also then filter down on, and I won't for, the, for, for purposes of speed, but these are um, just trees there that you can now filter that data down on. What I'm able to do is now start to gain a, an understanding for the average days that a vacancy is staying in a particular stage. So are we moving people through? So if we look at the SIFT here, it's taking on average 11.1 .1 days for candidates to move through the sifting stage. So why is that? From my experience, what typically happens, depending on the process, your recruiters go out there, they post the vacancy, they get lots of great applications, and it might be somebody else that's now doing the sifting, but what happens is there's a massive delay between that process and the sifting actually taking place. And to Leatham's point earlier, the pre-employment checks are taking over 30 days. 
I am absolutely convinced that you could correlate between the time it takes your process to the quality of the candidate that you end up with at the end of the process. Because the longer you take, those quality candidates are continually being approached by different organisations, be they public sector or private sector. So you now need to start thinking about, okay, well, if that is having an impact, are we actually hiring the best possible talent? Or is our process actually hindering us from being able to hire that best talent because it's just taking us far too long? And the people that are left are the people that maybe can't find alternative employment or are potentially of less quality. And I know that might be controversial, but I think as an ex-recruiter, um, it's certainly something that I uh, was able to explain to my clients in that speed is absolutely everything. What we're then also able to do through the system is define some service level agreements. So if all your stakeholders are absolutely engaged in the process of making sure that you hire the best talent, why don't you set yourselves internal SLAs? And you may already have them. But if you have them and you can now demonstrate how well they are being achieved through the process, you can then start to really understand, OK, was the SLA unrealistic because of what we're trying to do? Or are people just taking far too long and therefore we can see a spread of how that's going on? So to give you an example, if we look at audit here, we can actually see that we're well within the SLA because the SLA is the upper quartile there. Um, the average is, as you can see there, but we can, we're plotting for each application how long it's actually taking and, and able to kind of give some kind of judgment against uh, the speed at which we're doing things. So it's just giving that information that then empowers you to make those kind of decisions. So that's looking internally, that's looking potentially re retrospectively at what you're doing. But what you're doing has an impact. And what might be really interesting is to understand what your candidates are doing as a result of that experience. So what we have within the technology here, again, is the ability to see the high stats at the top. So we can see what my withdrawal rates are from when they started to submit it, from when they started a pre-online test to completion, from test to interview, and from interview to hire. And you can then say, well, why is 34% of the people that we're taking through a process leaving at the point where they've had an interview before they get hired? Is it that we're putting the right people in front of the candidate to promote, to Leatham's point earlier, to promote us as a brand, as an organisation that you'd want to work for? Or are they trotting out, tell me of the 34 requirements that we've asked for, how many of them do you meet? Turning the candidates off and therefore they decide after their first interview to drop out the process. So again, it's just giving you that data. And again, we can filter it by the dates, the title, the departments and whatever it might be. We can also then start to drive that down into um, gender and ethnicity. So you can start to see, are we, is there a certain part of our process where we're perhaps not saying the right things to make people feel that we are diverse and inclusive in our process? And by having that data there, you can start to ask those potentially challenging questions internally. So now we're looking at the withdrawals. We can also then, as part of the technology stack uh, within Olio, is throughout the process, however, however long that process is, and I could talk about process and what I think it should look like and how you can change that all day long, but we have the capability to capture candidate sentiment at, at potentially every single stage of the process. And by understanding how your candidates are feeling, you can then start to tailor and perhaps change your process to reflect accordingly. So again, we can see the statistics. We can see 191 respondents. We can see what the average overall good to excellent um, percentage rating is and the average answers. So typically it's one to five. So we're getting a sense for how content are the candidates as they're going through the process. But we can actually start to hone in on that 72% average by saying, okay, well, how does that fall across the application process, the interview process, and the onboarding process? And this will start to correlate with some of the withdrawals that you saw earlier, is if you are having lots of withdrawals, they're probably gonna give you negative feedback or less positive feedback uh, later on in the process. Again, we can filter down by the different departments, but now we're also able to see, okay, is the volume of applications that we're receiving impacting how people are scoring us? So that could be a resource issue. Do we have enough people doing the right kinds of things at the right point in the process 
to make sure that that candidate sentiment is as high as it can be. And then the final thing on this piece here is how and where are they scoring you in the process uh, across that one to five um, metric. The final thing I just wanted to touch on here um, was diversity. It's something that probably comes up in every single conversation with a prospect. I'm sure it comes up with our clients as well. Um, Steph and team uh, are challenged by doing it. And I, I'm, I can guarantee you we're all focused on it. Um, but how do you change the way we do things to make yourself look more diverse and more inclusive and, and kind of make that come through the process? There are other pieces of the technology that I could share with you uh, probably not for today, but uh, in terms of that engagement piece and making sure that you personalise the journey and you show the relevant content throughout the journey. We have a, uh, an intelligent um, engine that manages how you present content at the different stages. But what we are able to see now is start to see what are the adverse impacts that we're having through our recruitment process in terms of ethnicity or be it age or whatever the defining group is that you're looking to, to be reflective of. So that could be age, ethnicity, identity, religion, sexual preference. So as an example, just to sort of set the scene here, we can see here that 45% of uh, the applications that came through were from males, of which 46% went on to interview. And conversely, you can see the numbers there for uh, females. But again, like we showed earlier, you have the ability now to set internal SLAs as to what your targets, what you're trying to get to, and how do you measure up against those. So we've taken the four-fifths approach. Um, if you're within 80 to 120% of, the, num of, of the, the majority group, you're probably doing quite well. So this is, again, just very simply giving you the, the green or the red in terms of how well you're doing, because it may well be that you're overcompensating. As you can see here with Asian and, and Asian British applications, 14% of that majority group, so the majority group in this case uh, is white, so let me just scroll down so you can see that. So there's our majority group down here, which is what we're benchmarking against. And if I could use this mouse, I'll scroll back up again. So what we can see is 14% of overall applications were from that minority, of which 20% went through to interview which you could say is actually overcompensating, which is why we've now got that 137% number that you're seeing there. So ultimately, in summary then, what we're trying to do is really just give you the opportunity to understand your data, to be able to make the necessary changes that you feel um, could be made to improve that process. And the final thing that I wanted to show you in here was, depending on how you choose to do it, and it's back to that um, recruiter bias, what we're actually able to do based on the data is plot how your recruiters, whether there's any unconscious bias or bias going on from your actual recruitment team. So what you can see here uh, across uh, the horizontal is, is the ethnic bias and across the, um, sorry, the vertical is the ethnic bias and across the horizontal the gender bias. So the aim of this one is that your recruiters should be probably towards the centre in the middle and that's why they're green. But if we look at Ringo Calendar, what we can see here is he has a propensity to hire male white people. And that might be absolutely legitimate. It might be that they're the only candidates that apply for his jobs, and therefore they are the only people that he can hire. And I, I, whenever I ask the question when talking to prospects is, what are you doing about gender bias or um, unconscious bias? Sometimes the response is, it's all right, they've had the training. Well, that's great, but is it actually being followed through and are you actually starting to capture how your recruiters are behaving through that process? Name blinding does help, but there's also stats out there to say that decent recruiters can probably still tell the gender or the ethnic minority of, of um, the candidate based on the information that they see. Um, so this certainly goes a, a, a little bit further down the road in terms of giving you that information again to see does Ringo need some further training or is it just because that's the kind of people he's, he's, he's needing to recruit for those roles. So I know it's a bit of a whistle-stop tour. Um, hopefully that gives you a bit of insight into uh, our Talent Insights piece. Perfect. Thank you very much. A round of applause for Patrick, please.